Welcome to Flame University's exclusive webinar on the two essential approaches for producing a hit, according to Derek Thompson. I am Sunilesh Patabyal, a student ambassador at Flame University and your virtual MC for today. A very good afternoon to all. I take immense pleasure in welcoming all the students. Flame University's upskill primary upskill program's primary goal is to assist high school students in developing critical skills for their learning and growth. In this series, you will explore areas outside of your courses, which will help build your profiles for higher education. Please note, attendees who complete the entire session will be given a letter of participation, which you will receive let by next week. I will post a link to the feedback form in the chat section. You must fill it in order to receive your letter of participation. This is a required procedure. Today's session will be taken by Professor Gangaraju. Professor Gangaraju completed his postgraduate program in communications management from MICA. Prior to his MBA, he earned his BTEC from Gujarat Agriculture University, Anand. Professor Gangaraju has more than 16 years of work experience, starting with GCMFF Amul as a quality assurance officer. He followed his stint at Amul with a foray into communications at Cognito Advertising, Vadodara. His last work experience at Sony Pictures Network, SPN, was the most extensive, where he spent little more than 13 years managing roles across sales, marketing, and media research. In his last assignment at SPN, he was the vice president and head viewership maximization, which entailed converting the video OTT app Sony Lives AVOD viewers into SVOD subscribers and eventually pla platform content fans. His academic work experience started with Flame as a visiting faculty in 2016. It's a pleasure to have you amongst us, sir. I'm confident that students will feel more knowledgeable by the end of this session. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Sunilesh. So that was uh, Sunilesh, a uh, meritorious student uh, on campus from Flame University, uh, who also happens to be on the Dean's Roll of Honor. Uh, thank you for that uh, uh, nice introduction, Sunilesh. Uh, I'm also assisted by my colleague, Roshni, who is, uh, you know, uh, helping uh, us moderate the session along Sunilesh, who will be the MC here. Uh, just a few house rules. Uh, if you have any questions to ask, uh, the uh, way you have to do that is to raise your hand. Uh, between Sunilesh and Roshni, they will give you the chance to kind of you know, speak. Uh, if you're more comfortable writing in, then please drop your uh, questions in the Q&A part or in the chat area. And uh, between Sunilesh and I largely will keep an eye out for that and then possibly kind of, you know, taking those up while the session uh, progresses. So yeah, that's uh, essentially uh, to do with the house rules for this uh, session. Uh, what I want to start off with is to know you all a little bit more. Uh, so if it's possible, can I just request all of you all to drop in the chat uh, a format in which I would have you all uh, introduce yourselves. And I'm doing that first so that it sets the tone. So I want you to write your name first, then a forward slash, uh, the standard uh, that you're in class or standard. followed by your higher studies area of uh, interest. Followed by just one or two words to do with your career aspirations. That's essentially it. Uh, I'm not going to be able to go through the entire thing here, but uh, this just kind of, you know, will help me get a sense of the kind of crowd that I have in the audience. And uh, I'll try and see if I can contextualize, you know, the pace, the content, uh, examples for the profile of the participants. So that's essentially the idea of it. I see Tanvi is here. She's a class 10th uh, student, uh, sorry, class 11th student. Uh, there is the Bianchu, uh, standard 10th. Thank it you. It would also be great if you could just mention your city as well. So that we know which city you're from. Yeah, that will also help. Thank you, Ishwar. 
12th CBSC, Automotive Design, Interesting, and Journalism, along with a keen interest in business. Wonderful. Varnika, 12th Standard, Psychology, and particularly Criminal Psychology from Indore. Uh, Varnika, if you've all already been to our campus for the Summer Immersion Program, there is an amazing Criminal Psychology Program that is taken by our co-chair of the Psychology Department, Professor Sairaj. That's one program that you can look up to. Anushka Film Studies, wow. Uh, that's kind of like an exception that happens because we generally find people so much more wanting to be into the practice space or in the business space. But film studies is something which is a bit of an exception. They are more than welcome, of course. Uh, entrepreneurship, digital marketing, television production. Okay, done. Yeah, one cup, uh, whenever you find the time. Uh, Mahika, performing arts, movies. Uh, liberal arts, Diksha, Mushka, Dhruv, acting, dancing sports. Okay, wonderful. Adhiraj, gain work experience post college in corporate forms. Done. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to dive right in. Uh, keep uh, typing out uh, your introductions. Uh, this in our archives will also help us kind of, you know. Uh, moderate, modulate the sessions uh, in the near future. So, uh, thank you so much. Uh, while Sunilesh has already done the introduction, I'll still touch upon it in a bit, but let me just pull up the presentation as of now. Sunilesh, just confirm that you can see the presentation. Yes, sir, we can. Oh, done. Great. So, uh, this entire session is uh, split into two parts. The first one is going to be an overview of uh, Flames Film and Television Management Area, uh, where I'll just uh, you know walk you through how exactly we've structured this entire area, the kind of courses that we offer, the kind of you know uh, aspects that we uh, you know share uh, in terms of uh, knowledge areas, the faculty who uh, you know manage this entire space, and so on and so forth. This will be followed by a small masterclass. Masterclass ideally should be a little more detailed. But uh, what I'm trying to do is to demystify these uh, two essential approaches that uh, Derek Thompson kind of you know, gives in his must read for anybody who's got even a fleeting interest in uh, media and entertainment. So we'll just take that up with uh, international and Indian examples, and I'll you know uh, listen into what you all feel, it will be a two-way street. The masterclass will be kind of like a, not exactly exactly a workshop, but I will encourage all of you all to also, you know, uh, chip in. So that's essentially how we are going to be working uh, in the next uh, hour, hour and a half, so to speak. Uh, after the first section is over, which is the overview, uh, given some of you have already stated that you are interested in this area uh, from a career perspective, or for that matter, possibly, you know, uh, absolutely your indulgence also. If you have any questions, we will break for that after the first half is over. And then we will segue into the masterclass, after which we again have a QA. and So that's largely the structure. Let's uh, get this show on road. Uh, so starting off, if I was to tell you about how at Flame University, uh, we've kind of you know, put together uh, FLTV in as an area. Uh, uh, and uh, area as an operative word is crucial here because it's not a department. It connects into the media and journalism department, which has four different areas. And film and television management is one of the key areas. And uh, the word management is crucial here because as opposed to a uh, bunch of places, and that's something that I'll also delineate as we'll go forward, our focus is to kind of, you know, give you exposure into all three essential aspects that go into creating, uh, you know, film and television management or uh, that kind of a space self-sustainable. Starting off with uh, introducing to you all the four member uh, in-campus full-time faculty that all four of us all are here. Uh, we have Professor Malmi, uh, who is an academic specialist with us. Uh, uh, from her education standpoint, she's a postgraduate diploma uh, from FTI Pune, uh, one of the most premier institutes when it comes to film and television studies at a postgrad level. Uh, and she's had a very interesting journey uh, prior to FTI. Uh, she was in a corporate role, uh, thanks to having studied uh, postgraduate 
program and management from IIM Bangalore. So that's Professor Malini, whose area of expertise is cinematography, by the way. And we have Professor Aileen. Um, Professor Aileen is an associate professor and she's a PhD in film studies from uh, Dublin, uh, Trinity College. Uh, she is an Irish citizen who's been here in India for the past more than decade or so. And she's one of the most amazing scholars when it comes to film studies, uh, especially from the you know Indian standpoint. And that's a very rare exception. Uh, the kind of movies that she can recommend to you uh, can kind of you know make me look very, very pale. Uh, and then we have uh, to the left of my photograph here, we have Professor Ramna. Uh, Professor Ramna joined us last year. She finished her PhD in media studies from University of Texas, Austin, prior to which her undergrad studies were uh, from JNU. And again, she's also a film scholar. And uh, yeah, then it comes down to me. Uh, I'm an associate professor of practice. The new education policy encourages uh, faculty members like me to have corporate experience, which you must have heard when Sunilesh was introducing me, to join a uh, university such as this and give examples from, you know, on field. Uh, so there is the theoretical constructs which come to you from, you know, such talented faculty members as these three. And then there is some bit of reality of applying those things out there on the ground is where people like me come in. Uh, and I joined here from Sony Pictures Networks, uh, which is one of the leading uh, television networks uh, in India. Uh, moving on, the kind of visiting faculty profile that we have is listed right here for all of you all. Uh, four member team can't manage, uh, you know, such a decently, you know, uh, historical and well spread out area of film and television management is where uh, we lean on uh, people of this kind of a background to kind of, you know, take up some of those other courses which are also intrinsically dynamic. Uh, which keep changing. So how it helps us to bring in this visiting faculty a uh, lot for you is, you know, uh, they are bringing in what they are seeing as practitioners, as uh, corporate industry people. So uh, starting from Professor Sajal Kumar, who's the content lead at a platform called Yuva. He's an IAM boycott uh, pass out. Professor Manu Gautam, who's uh, a practicing director, producer, and is a founder of an initiative called Story People. He's a uh, Satyajit Ray Film and Television Institute, Kolkata Pass Out. Then we have Professor Pinaki Chatterjee, who is uh, a film distribution, uh, exhibition, syndication specialist. Uh, he's a pass out from FTI Pune. We have Professor Makran, and I have not included Professor Piyush. Professor Makran and uh, Professor Piyush take this course called uh, uh, Film Editing and Sound Design. And then we have, and both of them are FTI Pass Outs. And then we have somebody like Professor Harini Kalmuth, who's been a business head of uh, one of the largest Indian uh, television networks like Z. And now she manages uh, global marketing communications at uh, this place called Cactus Communications. And uh, she's a passer of University of London. Yeah. So that's essentially the uh, people who, you know, run the show here. Uh, what I want to now quickly do is to walk you all through... Uh, you know, this one larger question that, you know, some of you might be sitting on the fence and evaluating the area as that, why should, if at all, we be studying film and television management? So what I have is a kind of like a charter of questions that come to one's mind as uh, either an artist or as a practicing, uh, you know, filmmaker or possibly somebody who has aspirations for, say, a career like mine where, you know, you could be working with any of the uh, film and television kind of you know uh, business units out there uh, so it's it's an amalgam of all those you know set of areas and the kind of questions that you know people who have these aspirations uh, face or want to deceiver or possibly have to answer when uh, faced by uh, such questions so uh, this will give you a sense of if this, this is the kind of question that one is looking at then what exactly is happening in the classroom at film and television management uh, area in Claim University. So, uh, if I was to start off with a space that I'm sure resonates with a crowd of an age profile of yours, uh, uh, which is to do with music, then if you've ever noticed, and if not noticed, then this is something that we kind of you know discuss in a business of entertainment kind of classroom session here. Uh, is why uh, you know. Indian music industry, when you compare it with its Western counterparts, the songs here, when they become hit, or even if it 
they don't become a hit, but they're out there, they've been produced. Then why are these songs, which have been written, composed, performed by an entirely different set of creative people are known for the face of the song? And that is why I write this question as, why is a famous Arajit uh, sing some song known as that Shah Rukh Khan song? But when you go to the West, you look at songs to be uh, an output from Rihanna stable, or for that matter, uh, a bottling uh, space, or Adele uh, who sang Hello, one of the most amazingly popular songs uh, uh, ever. Uh, why exactly does this kind of difference happen when you look at the business of media and entertainment here in India and you try and compare it to you know the West? So that's something that gets revealed when you're talking. Uh, when you're inside the classroom. What exactly are these television rating points that everybody talks about around which the Indian television industry of upwards of 80,000 uh, crores uh, of rupees is built around? How exactly is that measurement taking place? Some of you might be into gaming and if you ever read uh, in any one of your news pieces that why would Microsoft look at you know buying off a gaming company and then uh, at a valuation like $70 billion, and why would Sony Corporation's uh, uh, shares price uh, tank in Tokyo immediately after? Why are a whole lot of business uh, businesses in media and entertainment, and now I think so much more digital spaces also, give out their products for free uh, on the internet uh, first up? Uh, why exactly, and now I'm getting into you know uh, the uh, art of uh, film studies, uh, where exactly or when exactly did the story of cinema start and uh, when did it start mirroring social, cultural and political realities to an extent that, uh, you know, you would think filmmakers are, you know, such an innocuous lot, but an entire government functionally feels that they are indulging in something that uh, requires them to be banished from their country of origin. And this is something that happens globally. So wh what exactly is this space that rattles uh, power centers? Um, and now I'm coming down to a question that deals with craft of cinema. Who is a continuity su supervisor when a movie is being shot? Uh, have you ever thought or noticed uh, in some of the films when uh, Shah Rukh Khan is standing left of the frame and he's got a coffee mug, say, uh, white in color, and uh, on the edit, when the scene shifts to who he's talking to possibly, and then it comes back to Shah Rukh Khan, the coffee mug color has changed. Uh, and that's something that a continuity supervisor on the set uh, is responsible for, where when the shoot uh, stops for the day, you capture the frame and you ensure that the frame continuity uh, is retained when you look at the subsequent shot. But if that's not happening, then there's a continuity supervisor who's missing. And why did India never feel that we should have one uh, on the sets? Uh, uh, why do, and this is a little bit of a loaded kind of a statement, but uh, stay with me on this. Uh, why do some people uh, feel that cinema uh, that invites people to think is uh, superior than the one that makes you sympathize for the characters? Most of us out there would like to believe that when you're watching a movie and it makes you cry, when it makes you laugh, and then you just go back home and forget about it. There are a set of people, a set of thinkers who would like to believe that that cinema is not as great as the one that leaves a question in your mind, which makes you think it invites you to evaluate it from your possible angle and then have a discussion around it. That's the kind of cinema that most of us should be talking about. Why do some people feel that? Uh, I don't know how many of you are into watching uh, uh, sports entertainment, but... Uh, UFC uh, Ultimate Fighting Championship. Why exactly is it? In fact, I think this is now a little uh, relevant for a year or two back where it was the rising star. Now I think it is the North Star, the star that everybody's chasing when it comes to sports entertainment. So what exactly is it about UFC that it has you know, uh, completely taken or stolen the thunder from WWE, which when you know people like me when we were growing used to be the ultimate uh you know uh so to speak contact sport i think that word it has now so much more meaning when you look at ufc uh have you ever wondered uh if you've heard that amir khan is a national craze in china what is it that amir khan has done and none of the other stars have been able to crack that makes him 
uh, national uh, icon, so to speak, the kind of records that Dangal broke in China uh, from a standpoint of the amount of monies that it made. And it put uh, some of the largest Hollywood franchises to shame in that year of release. Why should news be looked at as a public good? Why should it be freely available? Pretty much like tap water. Why should news be you know, so accessible? Uh, if you think print and newspaper is a dying habit, uh, it's only your parents who are picking up the newspaper, nobody else out there in the world is doing that, then uh, there's a bit of surprise there for you. Uh, it continues to be a growing space when you look at it here in India. Why so? Uh, and you will hear about uh, you know Indian film industry uh, biggest tallest claim to fame being that you know we produce the most number of films in a calendar year a calendar starting from Jan to December in its you know span of 12 months 52 weeks we produce the most number of films if you were to compare us to any of the other uh, film producing nations but that while it is touted as a strength why is that you know our weakness also is something that we discuss. And if at all, any one of you, uh, and I saw some of you are interested in uh, pursuing an acting career, a production uh, direction career, then if you imagine yourself to, you know, be a part of that team which creates the next larger production on Indian OTT, then uh, you should be studying film and television management. How do we do film and television management at Flame differently is essentially through this very simple little pictorial that I wanted to drive home the point. Uh, when you look at, uh, you know, our brochure, the kind of, you know, courses that we are offering, it's essentially a triad. You have a management angle, you have an art angle, and you have a craft angle. When you talk about art, you're talking about, uh, you know, like one of you said, uh, is interested in looking at film studies, then what is it that Professor Aileen and Professor Ramna bring to a life as a discussion when you are looking at cinema from their lens why is it considered to be high art and not just you know glamour and entertainment is essentially what comes under film studies screen studies kind of courses so that's art of cinema you look at craft of cinema and that's where a practicing aspect of cinema comes in where if you want to learn acting you want to learn uh you know cinematography you want to learn set design uh, or be uh, a director, screenplay writer, then that's the craft of cinema, which is the second part of this triad. And the third aspect is management, which is so much more crucial when you're looking at FLTBM because while you could be, uh, you know, uh, either of these, but you don't know what exactly keeps you in business is essentially where FLTBM and Flame uh, separates itself out over any of the other institutes where there could be a skew to either of these, but not, you know, complete focus on all of them. Yeah, uh, this is just a quick graphic for you all to know the kind of, you know, jobs that you can find for yourselves, uh, be it from uh, an art standpoint or craft standpoint or from a management standpoint. Uh, higher studies is essentially where pre pretty much like Professor Ramna or Professor Aileen, you could do an MA in film studies, media history, culture uh, is where you could go for higher studies from here. Or you could go for higher studies in direction, production, writing, cinematography from a place like FTI or an SRFTI or for that matter, uh, film schools which are out there globally well placed. From a production standpoint, you find yourself joining production houses, uh, film production houses, TV production houses as EP uh, associate producers. From a direction standpoint, you don't immediately start off as a director while you're making your short films here on campus, you start off as an assistant director or like I said, uh, continuity supervisor or script supervisor kind of a role is something that comes your way. Marketing, research and sales are the three verticals which come to you when you join a corporate place, uh, uh, even within a production house or for that matter, uh, corporate like a Sony, Star, Viacom, uh, Geo, uh, Geo Cinema uh, or uh, Netflix, uh, any of these places, you would have roles across marketing, research, and sales. And all of these three roles is something that I incidentally had the opportunity to kind of you know, go through while I was at uh, Sony Pictures Networks. So that's to give you a sense of the career graph when you're looking at film and television management. This is just to quickly give you a sense of where all our alums have already made it. Uh, and they had uh, specialization in film and television or communication, which is a little uh, more to do with uh, film and television management plus kind of space, which is communication studies. 
uh, they've been uh, placed at, or they find themselves working at Sony, Z, uh, production houses to networks like Sun and so on and so forth are the kind of, you know, placement opportunities that come your way when you look at uh, studies in FLDBM. These are the, some, uh, you know, uh, smattering of the courses that are offered from a management standpoint, uh, business of entertainment, television programming management, media management, film distribution and exhibition. And when it comes to art and craft of cinema, uh, film studies, uh, direction, production, editing, sound design, cinematography, production, uh, production design, all of these courses come under the art and craft area. So that's largely the lay of the land when you look at uh, pursuing film and television management uh, here uh, at Flame University. My interest in doing this uh, is so much more to ensure that any one of you who's aspiring or uh, in your social circles, there are people who are wanting to kind of you know, pursue a creative art, uh, know that there is a welcome place like film and television management area at Flame University. And it has this kind of a unique approach which gives you you know, or enables you to pick up gainful employment out of that and not just look at it only as a creative, creative pursuit. So uh, I want to kind of, you know, pause here and see if any of you have any questions to do with this aspect. Uh, so I'll just take a minute or two of a break and I'll invite you all to write in the chat area or uh, raise your hands and then uh, possibly ask your questions anything to do with the film and television management area, courses, uh, career opportunities, uh, any such questions if you have. Yes, uh, we have a Dhruv who wants to ask his question. So Nilesh, if you can help me here. Uh, Dhruv, you can now un unmute, yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, Hi, I Dhruv. have a question. I yes. have a question that, uh, can we have a role um, as an actor inside the uh, filmmaking? Or... So, Dhruv, uh, we, uh, uh, the film and television management area uh, comes under the School of Communication. Uh, if you're interested in acting, then uh, we have another uh, area uh, which comes under the School of Design and Performing Arts. So, if you're very clear about that, then uh, it would be better advised for you to kind of, you know, take up that course, which also is dealt by uh, some amazing faculty members uh, uh, in campus and also outside award-winning actors take uh, acting classes there. But uh, the way the liberal education format here is you come here, you do the first year of foundation and you might just look at acting, yes, and adding to it something else is where uh, Flame you uh, possibly kind of you know, help you out, uh, shape that uh, career aspiration of yours. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dhruv. So whoever has questions, please feel free to raise your hand if you are comfortable typing in your questions. Yes, I see two questions in the Q&A box. So, um, yes. sir, I'll just read out the question and you could I, I, I can read those. Uh, I'll take those up. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. So, uh, Somya Deep, uh, you're asking what does special effects come under? Special effects comes under post-production. Uh, so, uh, your first early step into that would be to do an editing course and then getting into SFX or special effects uh, that they call it. Uh, yes, so that's to do with special effects. Can we get this detailed with your detailed brochure on courses available in this field at your university website? Yes, uh, I think uh, my colleagues will help you out there, Shweta. Yes, so just to, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, this entire recording is there, which will be uploaded on YouTube. You could have a look there. And if you log into the Flame website as well, you will find all details. Thanks, Sunilesh. Uh, Somya Dipya, yeah, uh, the person who makes the props on the scene is somebody who's responsible for set design. Uh, these are the people who uh, produce uh, or curate uh, aspects to do with how the scene has been imagined. Uh, and uh, we have two very interesting courses which walk you through that. And that is uh, uh, one is called mise en scène, which is something which comes in the fourth year. And the other one is production design, where uh, the students understand 
how to produce a particular narrative in the form of uh, the cinema what is the design meant to be looking at they are all given an x amount of budget for them to kind of you know buy those things create those set designs here on campus uh, uh, in this area that we call as the kalidas hall <clears throat> How big is the scope of being a producer of films? Uh, you take any larger uh, producer uh, name, it goes all the way till there. Uh, uh, when it comes to production, production is uh, quasi or it's kind of like a balancing act between being, uh, you know, an art uh, understanding person and also a business understanding person. And that's where our course of producing films uh, helps you so much more. Uh, what is the difference between film appreciation and film production? So, uh, Anushka, film appreciation is to do with scholarly studies of the art of cinema. So, the two professors that I walked you through as uh, my colleagues right up front are the people who've done MA and PhDs in film studies. They become scholars studying cinema at starting from the time of its initiation to how cinema is shaping as a narrative at this point in time. And they do scholarly studies uh, when it comes to film appreciation. Film production is so much more to do with, uh, you know, when you get a creative concept, how do you uh, bring it to uh, life? How do you curate a team? What kind of a director do you want to onboard? Sitting with the director, how do you want to change the narrative of the film because your budget that you've been allocated or you know you have access to is only so much. So what exactly in the scenes or construct of the narrative do you want to curtail it in a fashion that it sits within the budget? How do you distribute it so that you recover your monies, not just box office, but also OTT rights and so on and so forth is where film production comes in. You will be given access to the softwares that you will be uh, using out here, be it editing or sound design. Media management is to do with understanding uh, various different media verticals, TV, print, movies, digital gaming, and how exactly uh, in the overall pecking order of, say, if uh, last last year, the entire media and entertainment space was lacking 20,000 crores, then who has uh, what kind of a share of that entire business is where media management comes through. Uh, I'll just take one final question, which is psychology as a career is required in film production. Uh, I, I would never say no for something which is as inviting and welcoming as a uh, film area, uh, because uh, psychology could definitely come handy when you're uh, and if you also have a nice way to put pen to paper, you can also write, then possibly as a screenplay writer, how do you empathize for a character and then bring them to life, which so many po more people will be able to relate to because you've been able to look at it from a psychologist perspective off the top of my head is what comes to my mind. Or you could just be a plain uh, lyrics writer and lyrics writers are essentially doing something, a compressed form of what a larger narrative like a film is. Yeah, so... Uh, I'll just pause it at that because I want to get on to the second half of this session. And uh, uh, before we shut down, I'll just try and see to it that I've been able to attend to all the questions that have been raised. But thank you so much. All of those are very probing and relevant questions. So I will try and answer them uh, as we progress. So I'll just get on to the second half. Right. So uh, this is essentially the overall invite that we sent out to all of you all on uh, this amazing book that's been written by uh, Derek Thompson uh, and the two essential approaches that he kind of, you know, carves out uh, as he, you know, uh, elaborates on what exactly goes into creating kids. The reason I chose this uh, is because I wanted to kind of, you know, uh, serve the holy grail to the extent that it can be demystified because Derek also signs off by saying that end of the day, the way something becomes a hit has so many other variables that keep changing. Uh, but the two essential approaches that he suggests increases your probability to kind of, you know, uh, uh, craft a hit. 
And that's what anybody and everybody who's in the space of media and entertainment is trying to kind of you know, create, be it a writer, uh, be it a filmmaker, be it a songwriter, anybody and everybody is trying to put something out there, which, you know, would be delightful for them if it is being consumed by so many more people uh, is where I thought this book becomes very, very crucial. And this is an essential read, at least some sections of it in my course of business of entertainment. So let's uh, first figure who Derek Thompson is. Uh, Derek Thompson is a writer. He was earlier a media editor, but given his so many more uh, involvements, he is right now a writer at The Atlantic. Atlantic is an American uh, news publication uh, which focuses on a variety of subjects and it dates back to all the way to 1857. So one of the oldest news publications uh, out there, uh, it comes from... Uh, uh, the United States of America, incidentally. And what he writes on is media economics. Uh, the book out of which I've curated this uh, second half of the you know interaction with all of you all uh, is called Hitmakers, the Science of Popularity in an Age of Distraction. He's given it this small little qualified towards the end because that's so much more relevant to all of you all uh, generation because there's so much content out there that what exactly should people be focusing on so that they can create a hit is what the book tackles. So let's uh, have you all do quickly one thing and I'm not going to pause for this, but what I want you to do is before we begin, uh, I want you all to identify radically new. So that those are the operative terms here, right? Uh, radically new movie that you loved, right? So a movie that you've seen in the recent past that you really liked, but if it was in your way of defining it, if it was radically new, then identify that for yourselves and then write a log line. It sh and log line, by the way, just to introduce you quickly, an elevator uh, pitch understanding of log line is, you know, this small little pressy note that a producer writes for a screenplay and then that su uh, and submits that screenplay to a platform. That's something uh, uh, that a log line does. An ideal log line is not more than 27 words. So it's a synopsis of the movie that you're looking at. So if you could just identify a radically new movie that you loved watching in the recent past and write a log line for it, it should not be no, it should not be more than 27 words. Keep that in mind. Quickly, just take one minute and write. There are no right or wrong answers. You're not trying to do anything fancy. You're just trying to explain this one. Uh, two, two and a half hour long movie that you've just seen in the past. Just write that down for yourselves. And uh, if no place else, then just drop it in the chat. I just want to see uh, what all you've been able to kind of you know, capture. And we'll revisit this. So we'll come to it uh, towards the end of this, you know, first takeaway that we have from Hitmakers. But as of now, just uh, structure that log line and drop it in the chat section. I'm giving you all one minute to do that. Type away, don't think too much. You're not impressing anyone. You're just wanting to capture what comes to your mind when you try and remember this radically new movie that you saw in the recent past and you loved it. I think we have a hand that's raised. Sunilesh, if you can help me there. Uh, yes, sir. it was raised, but now I think that is lowered. Was is, was that Shashank? Shashank uh... Yes, I think that's Shashank. Uh, Shashank, you can unmute and ask your question now. Yeah, I believe that was my mistake, sir. That's okay. Shashank, are you talking? Hello? Yes, you're audible, Shashank. Go ahead. G, hello? G, Shashank, tell me. G, for your test, you have to say the university, film university. Yes, we have to say the film university. We are taking a class, Shashank. सुनेंगे तो आपको समझ आ जाएगा हम लोग किस बारे में डिस्कस कर रहे हैं अच्छा जी ओके ओके मैं यही पूछ यही क्वेश्चन था 
ओके शशांक ठीक है शशांक थैंक यू do we have log lines yes uh, thank you so much varnika family bond that can never be broken an artist teacher comes to a traditionalist school only to change school and life of students quickly explores the idea of death and then she's connected to it character from his own village history about to japan instruction physicist after bits of the attack massive damage okay thank you nitiksha i'm just giving you all 5 10 more seconds if you can attempt the log line it's just an interesting exercise uh, and we will be revisiting it in another 5 10 minutes okay so retain that uh, also paste it in a note if you have to and like i said we'll revisit that uh, let me just move ahead here so now we are trying to kind of you know, unravel the first part the first essential approach that goes into uh, creating a hit uh, and i have a bunch of questions here uh, what i would have you do is uh, you know give us an emoticon uh, in response to each question either a thumbs up when you want to say yes and i or a thumbs down if you want to say no so if my first question to all of you all is given a chance would you upgrade your wardrobe with the latest fashion trends and styles give us a thumbs up if uh, you know you are saying yes don't raise your hand give us the emoticon uh, and i am understanding the two hands that were raised as an attempt to give us a thumbs up but just give us as many emoticons as you can uh, and sunilesh would you be able to see how many thumbs up are we receiving yes i can see that sir yes sir so we have close to i think 36 participants here uh, just give me a count of the number of people who are giving us a yes in response to this question which is given a chance would you upgrade your wardrobe with the latest fashion trends and styles between the yes and the no are we coming close to 36 we are at 50 percent there now uh how many 16 yes? yeses and three no's so, so far okay so i'll take that for the time being as 16 and how many no's did you say three no's for now done okay i'll just make that note separately so that i don't let out the other set of questions the second question is when it comes to following social trends do you actively engage in the latest challenges and trends that go viral and uh bear in mind that these are safe challenges or trends we don't want to go towards anything that is dangerous but uh, in general what is your approach when you look at you know some of the upcoming social trends uh when they are the latest ones they are really radically new do you generally go for them or you're at least curious about them if it's a yes give us a thumbs up and if it's a no give us a thumbs down So we'll just keep uh, making a note of how many yes and how many no for this question, and give me a number in another five ten seconds. We have ten noes and seven yeses, sir. Oh, so there is a little bit more of a no here than seven and ten done. Okay, let's go to the next one. Imagine your smartphone is still working perfectly, and your parents are really happy about that. But there is something that has gleamingly new that has been just launched. Would you still want to upgrade to this latest model that's come out because it's new? Give us a yes. An interesting no. question. <laughs> yes, and so much more heartburn if it goes towards the why for parents. 
how many yes and how many no? What is the trend looking like? 13 no's and 3 yeses. 15 no's now. 3 yeses. Only 3? Nobody yes. wants a new phone? I hope everyone's uh, you know, sharing their absolutely true thoughts. Okay. When it comes to movies and TV shows, do you often seek out new releases and the latest trends? Or do you go for something old and classic? Thumbs up and thumbs down. Thumbs up for yes, thumbs down for no. When it comes to movies and TV shows, do you seek out new releases and the latest trends? Give me the breakup, Sunilesh. 15 yeses, 4 noes, sir. Okay. So we have had uh, 16 yes for the first question and 3 noes. Then we had uh, a reverse order for the second question. Uh, a reverse order for, and that was a close one, by the way, for the, seven, the second question, 7 and 10. And then we had 3 and 15, and then we had 15 and 4. So is, is there a common thread that all of you can make out here? Uh, and I can take any one hand raised. If anybody can decipher the one common thread that we are trying to kind of you know, capture here. If one wants to speak, we can take a hand raised here and we can listen into you. Yes, Sonia Deep. Yes, you can go ahead, Shomadipa. Uh, we are chasing what's new. We want to keep up with the time and follow what's going on around us. Thank you so much, Swamiradip. Yes, and why would that be the case? Have you ever wondered? Uh, and that's something that, uh, you know, uh, in the first aspect, which goes into creating a hit, uh, Derek Thompson says, we are all caught up largely in a cult of the new. More often than not, all of us are all told if it's the latest of, you know, set of shoes that have been released, if it's the latest of movie that has come out, or if it's the latest of song that has just broken the Billboard Top 100, or anything and everything that's new is something that all of us all, uh, you know, if we were all to be considered as a market space, all of us all to be, were to be considered as consumers, then we are all driven towards this new, this new innovation that is coming out. And that's what most of us are caught up in. But uh, if I was to ask you all in your opinion to produce a hit, uh, how important is it that that content is new? If not just new, then very, very new. Uh, give us a thumbs up and a thumbs down again. When we are creating the hit, how important is it that the content is new? And this can be a song, this can be a movie, this can be a book. Uh, this can be a new game. How much do you think it should be really, really new? Uh, give us a thumbs up if you say yes, if you want to say yes. And give us a thumbs down if you feel that's a no. And Sunilish, just give me a count there. So far, we have 11 yeses and 3 noes, sir. Right. So that's where most of us who would kind of, you know, have a little distant view or a generic sense of what's seemingly happening in the media and entertainment space would like to believe that to produce a hit, it is important that the content is new. But what Derek says is if you're trying to create a hit, you need to lean a little bit more on familiarity than over novelty. Uh, and stay with me here, uh, where his emphasis is on so much more, whatever is familiar is where, you know, the hit probability lies so much more and not as much on the novelty. Uh, it's more kind of like an equation, but uh, this is essentially what he says. If you're creating something uh, as an attempt to create that next new hit on the horizon, then you should be creating what he calls them as familiar surprises. And look at the play of the two words. He says familiar surprises. Surprises have intrinsically given the word a shorter duration, uh, you know, meaning, so to speak. 
and familiar is this larger you know uh, space that he is trying to create so he explains it by using this statement where he says audience is like art that gives them the jolt of meaning which often comes from an inkling of recognition that's what uh, familiarity should be uh, and how it should be focused on when you're trying to create a hit uh, he gives this very interesting uh, acronym called maya which stands for most advanced yet acceptable and this as an acronym is something that uh, one of the uh, pretty uh, much or doyen of the american design industry called raymond louis uh, who's responsible for some amazing lot of things right from the automobile design to uh, uh, you know the shape of air force one the plane that flies the american president to how the space vehicle out there in uh, you know uh, the international space station to any spacecraft going out there uh, looks like the you know the uh, glass window that looks over the planet earth all of those designs were crafted by this gentleman called Raymond Louis and he gives uh, you know this acronym which is most advanced yet acceptable and uh, this is you know kind of deciphered by a philosopher Immanuel Kant who proposes that pleasure can arise from a free play of the mind. When a person discovers an attractive idea or story, it triggers a dialogue between imagination and understanding. Imagination and understanding, something that you're trying to figure and something that you already understand. Each quickens the other. So according to free play, beautiful art, music, ideas, all of them offer a kind of cognitive tease. They dangle the promise of comprehension, but never provide the full satisfaction of getting it. That's where the adventure lies. So free play is a lovely idea, right? Because uh, it's amazing to think that your thoughts and your feelings have dancing partners in the space of imagination. So that's got to be the first takeaway that you have when you look at, uh, you know, your attempt at uh, creating a hit. And that is, you know, uh, you should lean a little bit more on familiarity over novelty. What I have out here as a graphic is largely how I would define a market, which is a very inward looking kind of a space where familiar uh, stereotypes or handles are all right in the middle. And it's a moving circle that is so much more inward looking. Novelty seems to be lying outside of this space, right? So the producers of content of media and entertainment who create again and again new handles, new familiar surprises to do with these stereotypes or established facts are the ones who have a chance of creating a hit. And when we talk about a hit, what we're talking about that there is mass consumption or what just got uh, created. Uh, some of the very, very creative set of people would find this kind of a direction a little disappointing and that is very very understandable because they come organically with this appetite or uh, you know thought to create that new aspect so imagine them sitting on the edge of this circle they are the ones who are staring out and they are the ones who are looking at the novelty so if uh, you were to imagine scenarios where somebody's created something new you have to imagine that they are still working off the edges of largely the familiar stuff and they've created their iteration attempt at something novel and more and more such attempts gets created you can imagine that that movement gets coalesced into this circle and this space, space the sphere of familiar grows larger because it has now subsumed what just got created by this new artist and i can give you example of air yeah, rahman back in the 1990s a sound that uh, the gentleman created that we had never ever heard we thought never ever heard but the underpinnings of that were so much more familiar but what he did was he brought in various different instrumentations and you know the generation of my parents could talk about adi barman to have done that people who are sitting on the edge of this larger space of consumption looking at something out there new continuing to hold on to familiarity and attempting to bring in something novel is how this market space has grown but if you were to have a higher probability of crafting something uh, radically successful then you would always be well advised to not give in to the myth of the cult of the new and you know work off familiarity and have a small little attempt at bringing in something novel is what uh, derek says when he talks about 
the first hit maker approach. And there are enough and more examples that I can throw at you, right? You could look at a Batsha and you could look at a Nazi. Both seem to be talking about or you know performing under hip hop, but the ones who are really, really novel or the ones who really look at hip hop so much more at the core level would want to say Nazi does so much more original stuff, but Batsha does so much more repetitive kind of stuff. But you know where the market lies between these two. You look at franchisee cinema like a Marvel Cinematic Universe of Avengers, and you try and compare it to these one-off kind of you know movies. The uh, Barbie Oppenheimer release that just happened. You would have heard about the numbers that they made, and I'll quickly in a bit run you through the box office collection numbers to just give you a sense of the over abundant you know uh, hold of franchisee cinema on box office numbers and individual movies like Oppenheimer or Barbie, the kind of numbers that they are being able to make. And we have examples of that here in India also, if you were to look at the Singham, uh, you know, uh, sequence. Look at the sequels in case of books and movies. Once something has been established, once that familiarity has been established, you try and, you know, just layer it with a little bit more novelty and then you create a snowballing effect is where you create a larger hit. Or look at this tendency to kind of, you know, remix old songs. Your parents must be disenchanted about the fact that this song was so amazing when it was the original, but such a sham job has been done of it when they're remixing it. That is happening because that familiarity that got established with the original song, it just needs a shade of surprise and then you have a higher probability of creating a new hit. Uh, any other thought that you have, your experiences or your thoughts, I invite you to share them here in the chat while I'm just coming out of the presentation and walking you through the box office numbers to do with franchise cinema and uh, independent cinema. Please drop any experiences, thoughts that you have when you hear about familiarity, uh, you know, uh, trumping novelty. This, by the way, on your screen right now, you're seeing uh, Hollywood movies because the data that comes from that side is uh, amazingly uh, transparently shared. Uh, we have yet to kind of you know, step up to that kind of uh, number gathering here. We've covered quite a bit of ground here, but it's yet to happen. But just look at MCU, MCU, then you have one Titanic uh, at number four. Uh, at $2.2 billion equivalent from uh, James Cameron. Then you have again, uh, you know, one of the most iconic uh, films with so many sequels, Star Wars, again, MCU, Spider-Man franchisee, Jurassic World, which went into, uh, you know, uh, sequels, Lion King, which was remade, Avengers again, Furious, which has had a 10th or 11th edition, if I'm not mistaken, Tom Cruise's uh, Top Gun, Frozen, which has had multiple editions, and then comes Barbie, right? So between one film that is at the fourth position, that is Titanic, and then the other one, which is Barbie at number 14, everything else is telling you so much more about the strength of familiarity over novelty. If you were to understand independent standalone films as, you know, uh, novel films and familiar films being uh re-engineered again and again as the familiar stuff then you know where the market stands yeah i hope i'll get to see some interesting thoughts i'm going to move forward just in the interest of time uh so that's the first one that i'll have you bear in mind which is if you're trying to create a hit or you're attempting to create a hit then you need to lean a lot more on familiarity as opposed to what the cult of the new tells you that it should be so much more to do with uh, new movie. Uh, now, what I would have you do as I progress forward is, you know, I'm not going to pause here, but what I would want you to do is to rewrite that log line that you just wrote about your favorite movie, now keeping familiarity over novelty in mind. And the reason I'm having you do this is so that you, it can kind of, you know, register with your mind that when you're pitching something, uh, then you got to be able to give somebody a handle to, you know, the handle of the door is where the surprise lies and it attracts people but once they walk in they got to be walking into a familiar space is how log lines should be because as of today and i can tell you that from personal experience also movies are being picked up just on the back of log lines 
and how and logline has become the equivalence of the earlier sales pitch to do with you know walking up to a producer walking up to a network to kind of you know convince that they produce the film that you have in mind is why i would now want you to rewrite the film's logline the way you wrote before uh, you could take one of the examples from uh, you know my uh, childhood days back to the future was a movie michael j fox uh, steven spielberg uh, and the logline there is a young man is transported to the past where he must reunite his parents before he and his future cease to exist so as opposed to you know any other time machine movie uh, here is something which got you know embedded into uh, the family uh, aspect of you know the time machine so the time machine is a draw but again it tries to you know work around how uh, uh, michael j fox who's the protagonist in the film looks at his dad and he would expect him to deliver on a few aspects which he gets to kind of you know uh, challenge when he goes back in the past so just relook at your log lines and attempt them again keeping how you have to lean a little bit more on familiarity as opposed to novelty so that the movie that you're pitching gets picked up hopefully uh, is a thought process yeah so that's the first one uh, so derek thompson uh, describes his book in a six word thesis and the first three words are familiarity over novelty and now we are coming to the second half which is the second essential approach that he recommends when you're trying to craft a hit and uh, before we go there uh, <clears throat> if i was to ask the entire lot of you what is the kind of content in your opinion uh, has an inherent tendency to go viral and viral as a term is something that all of you very much relate to uh, so if you could just give me words single descriptive words of the kind of content which you think has so much more tendency to go viral emotional uh, horrifying or whatever are your catch phrases if you could just give us those words in the chat area again nostalgia okay funny content with a twist action and adventure yeah replicable but also unique interesting nice relevant okay thank you ben action and sentimental interesting mind bending okay makes you really really think simple and interesting moody vibey nice okay uh if i was to go to the next question while we are unraveling the second aspect recommended by derek on creating a hit uh, what do you think is happening when people say a particular thing went viral uh and i'll not take this question up for you all to answer at this point in time because i'll just try and attempt that through this visual and which is if all of you all to what to imagine uh by shutting your eyes that if something's gone viral then what exactly is the process that is taking place then would you not imagine it like this and i'm using a pandemic you know uh, visualization here because virality has to do with epidemiology and that's where they look at the first person so we've all just kind of you know emerged not just but a while back we just emerged out of a pandemic so there is a patient zero the first one who contracted the disease and then that individual uh, passed it down to one individual and those people passed on to subsequent set of individuals is how you would like to think anything going viral now come out of the epidemiology of it don't look at the pandemic part but this is essentially what you or for that matter anybody who's not deciphered how things go viral would like to imagine that when a, an amazing song is written then somebody just puts it up on youtube and intrinsically the content has such an amazing magnetism to it that uh, or not magnetism it has such a push to it itself that it just keeps moving forward everybody feels that this is something that everybody under the sun should be listening to is how people will be sharing forward but that derek says is the myth of virality virality uh, is something that is not at play when you look at content going further ahead the 
second part of the six word thesis that Derek gives about his book is why we looked at familiarity over novelty. The second thing that he's telling you is distribution over content. If any one of you feels that you've created one of the most amazing artistic expressions and intrinsically that content has an amazing uh, aspect to it, which lends it wings, then you will be disappointed to know that there is nothing like virality. It is a hard-nosed marketing and distribution push to the content, which leads it, uh, you know, traveling so much more further ahead. And I'll show you examples. Uh, so as opposed to the first pictorial that you saw of patient zero passing it on to one person at a time, that one person passing it on to one more set of people, he says there are no such million one-to-one -one moments. Every individual passing it on to another one individual, then passing on to one more individual. There is no such thing like million one-to-one -one moments when it uh, is about content that is becoming popular. But what is happening is there is one to million moments. And what does that stand for? That stands for broadcast. So if I was to look at my generation, the uh, towards my left, uh, and on the right of the screen is where the original broadcast used to be. And I would like to imagine some of you have a little bit of sense. Uh, your generation still understands broadcast a little bit, unlike my daughter who would you know, watch a linear television and would say, uh, can we just skip this part? Because she doesn't understand how linear television used to work. But that was the traditional broadcast where TV used to tell you 9 p.m. every day, on Baniga Karodpati is the deal. So that is one simultaneously sending it out to a million people. So it's kind of like, uh, and I'm taking it as a metaphor, imagine it as a bomb, a culture bomb. It goes off and immediately so many millions of television households who are tuned in, they all get that content is how it used to operate. But viral distribution, which is right in the middle, which is patient zero passing it on to individuals is how virality is meant to work. That's not exactly how things used to be when it was broadcast days. Now for your generation, it is called diffused broadcast. And the reason Derek has been able to, uh, you know, decipher this is because now we are all in a space of data where you can see, once you see something on the internet, how exactly does it travel? And he says content that goes popular. Okay, we are not talking about everything out there. We are talking about hit content. They all seem to go through diffused broadcasts. So as opposed to this broadcast, which was linear television, uh, uh, appointment television, you're looking at diffuse broadcasts. There are influencers, there are platforms, there are aggregators who are passing it on in their own capacity to a few hundred thousands out there from where another set of uh, influencers or aggregator platforms are passing it on to another hundred thousand is where diffuse broadcast is so much more the way that content goes popular when you're talking about content for your age and generation, as opposed to, you know, my days where it used to be broadcast. Now, if one was to just look at an Indian example for me to drive home the point of how distribution trumps content, I'm giving you this example of a song, which I don't know if uh, you guys have heard, but I'm referring to this one right here, I hope. Switch to Ghanaian Men Acnofight Face Wash. Yani pimples. We'll just wait for the ad to play out and then I'll play the original song. So how many of you knew that Bomb Diggy as a song was an original in 2017 and it got released on Savan as an original song. Uh, and that was sung, of course, by Zach Knight and Jasmine Walia. This is the original song. Most people out there won't know. And as of today, in six years, it has hit 125 million views on YouTube. But just to help you understand the point of distribution over content, uh, I'm going back to 2017 when this song was released. And in first 10 months, the song hit 66 million streams. During this period, it hit a peak of, 
you know, views in one day to be 0.2 million. But when this track was given to T-Series, which is a huge music label here in India, the uh, biggest one, in fact, with a global top 50 ranking, I think it's number two or number three at this point in time on YouTube, uh, they created their own track, which is what most of you might have seen. And then they put it into their own produced film, which is Sonu Ketty Tupi Sweet is what the film is called. And then they put it out there. That kind of a distribution thrust ensured that in five months of this movie version of the song, uh, it hit a complete view count of 378 million. As, as you've seen, the original on YouTube, the Zach uh, Knight and uh, Walia song has 125 million views. Let's check out how the movie version has hit a 1 billion number. And that's what we are doing. More importantly, the 1 billion number right here. So just for you all to be able to appreciate the strength of distribution and not get caught up in this myth of virality is why I wanted to share this one uh, interesting case. And uh, the other interesting case, which is so much more possibly applicable to your generation, is how internet works through its diffused broadcast mechanisms as opposed to the viral distribution. And here is another song that possibly a bunch of you might have heard, and that came out in 2011 by a Canadian singer songwriter. Her name is Carly Jepsen, uh, and the song is Call Me Maybe. And it debuted at 97 in the Canadian Hot 100. But by the end of the year, it was still not in the top 20. And do you know what happened after that? Is the diffused broadcast effort. But let me just see if I have the song curated here. Okay, I have not kept it here, but let's just finish the story. This song, which, you know, by the end of the year, in 2011, could not hit the top 20, got a diffused broadcast push when Justin Bieber, another Canadian pop singer, I'm sure you guys have heard about him, heard it on the radio, praised it on his Twitter handle, and then in early 2012, makes a YouTube video out of it with his bunch of friends. And this includes pop star Selena Gomez. They're all dancing to it. That video now has more than 70 million views and it helped launch Call Me Maybe because of the distribution push that it created. Uh, and it has now the original song has become one of the biggest pop songs of the decade. You just look at the number of views that are happening for the song. You know what one is talking about. So that is for, you know, you all to make sense through uh, what Derek is saying when he's saying distribution trumps content. So, and there is nothing called virality. It is distribution, which is at play for a content to become a hit. Uh, if I can, then I would love to hear in the next five odd minutes, your personal instances of any viral content piece which reached you in the recent past. I would love to kind of, you know, take those up in the chat section. Yes, Ben, the point that I think uh, Derek is trying to make is there could be shareable content. You could go on to share it, uh, but the larger critical aspect is, and this is something which could be an amazing song, it could be an amazing short film, but it will languish where it is at when it is released on the internet till you don't focus on how to ensure that somebody who's got a far wider reach, especially for your generation on the internet, uh, influencer level reach for them to pick it up pretty much like the Canadian song uh, that we just spoke about uh, and it went so much more popular from there so it isn't as much to do with the content's intricity we are keeping those constants that the song is amazing the movie is amazing the book is amazing but for it to go out there and become popular you need to see to it that distribution is playing its role Right. Yes, Kirtana, you're right. Yeah.
with that i will uh, stop it right here and uh, we can have you all raise your hands uh, and sunilesh will unmute you we have 10 minutes to take any questions uh, and of course uh, once the session is over at 4:30 i will go through the q and and then i'll try and see if i can answer those questions so while you guys are raising your hands i'll just see if i can address some of the questions here in the q and a part yes sir we have a few of them in queue yes go on uh, so so the first question i think so from previous uh, ojas is asking how do we get our first chance to work in a real film so ojas uh, uh did uh, sunilish by the way ojas ask uh, act or uh, get a uh, uh no sir the question says how do we get our first chance to work in a real film so uh that happens uh, ojas still uh, pretty much in a gig kind of a fashion uh once you uh, you know uh, worked on the craft for your own self where you fine tuned it you understood how masters who come and gone and who are still around how they've created a way for you to create good cinema you attempted it at it you failed yourself you've created your own show reel is what you take to production houses and then you pitch for a role you again are on the sets uh working with these production houses on their next set of bunch of things is where you know uh you figure how a film uh, actually on the floor is taking shape and then the kind of craft that you are practicing your own self be it writing be it, uh, you know shooting something of your own once you show that is where you build uh, confidence uh, between how you deliver things on the floor while somebody else is moving is happening and then showcasing what you want to produce of your own direct of your own is how uh, you get a chance to you know work in a real film i think that has answered the question uh, next question name is not mentioned it says it is is it possible to get placed in a marketing agency with specialization in content creation if taking media management course example zomato's content marketing branch like go out delhi a uh, very good question and my answer is a uh, yes absolutely there are enough and more people who are doing that where uh, they understand the art and craft of uh visual storytelling from a course like ours and then they find themselves working in an agency which is crafting creating that content for advertisers uh or possibly uh you know uh for uh, avs for corporates so you can definitely look at that kind of a role taking shape yes yeah uh somebody's asked movie. a question on the when a yeah. part that can effectively be taken as a major or only for minor it is to be taken it can be taken as either so both major and minor are okay yes in english yes sir so again another question i am interested in trying out opportunities as a voice over artist however want to do it in parallel with a career in marketing is this feasible this question is by kan if i am pronouncing it right right so voice over artist is uh, something that uh, is uh, pretty much doable while you're doing anything and everything out there under the sun the reason i say that is because i have a batchmate of mine uh, she's done a voice over for some marvel films in hindi she is a classical singer uh, and right now she's working with a marketing firm i believe in up lucknow uh, we also had a professor out here on uh, campus flame university who was a journalist and who is a practicing voice over artist himself so uh, voice over artists can do it full time or they can kind of you know do a bipedaling thing where there is a larger scheme of thing that they are already pursuing and voice over can support uh, their creative interests yes yes sir uh, clubbing a few questions together that is course related uh firstly how would the course help students to be more creative does the course also entail writing scripts and uh, for a class 11 student is there any subject that they can choose for film making um okay uh the course through uh, 
to the craft part of the triad that I was sharing in the presentation helps you become so much more creative, fine tune your creativity, where, uh, you know, be it cinematography, direction, screenplay writing, uh, pertinently to the question to do with writing, uh, you can pursue that. We also have clubs on campus here where uh, ellipsis kind of a club is where you can pursue your writing beyond what is happening inside the classroom. Uh, we have uh, Professor Michael who takes runs that club along with student volunteers. Uh, so yes, the course definitely helps you, you know, be in touch with your creative side and also fine tune it as you, you know, progress over the course of two years. Uh, sorry, your three or four year course here. Yes, sir. And the third question was, is there any subject in class 11 that we can choose for filmmaking? I think uh, if there are any creative writing kind of courses or uh, language courses, or, and even if they're not there for you to kind of, you know, pursue it as a co-curricular activity, extracurricular activity, uh, continue writing a blog, shoot something off your mobile handset device and show that uh, while your selection process is happening is good enough. So. You don't need to be bothered about not having a course opportunity in your school right now, but just your creative pursuits outside of the classroom also good enough. Uh, and if they happen to crack uh, a certificate or you get some accolades, that's something which is a cherry on top of the cake. Somebody's just that's asked right. here saying, if we take up FLTVM as a major, what course would you suggest we take up as a minor? Uh, the uh, student uh, handbook guides you there. Uh, you And in my classroom, I have some amazing combinations which happen. There are students who combine FLTVM with economics. There are students who are combining it with psychology. Uh, there are students who are combining uh, it with uh, all the possible areas that we are offering out here. It just comes down to who do you want to be and how do you want to take it forward? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can see one question by Chaitanya, which says uh, a general question is how do production houses like Disney, which includes Marvel, Star Wars, Princess movies, etc., gather a big revenue? Is it more professional screenplay or better money spent or just the target audience of kids? I think this is a, a very uh, layered question that would need a lot more long drawn uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, ongoing discussion. But if I, I was to sum it up, Chaitanya, then uh, uh, Disney has, uh, you know, changed over the course of years. Uh, and it seems to be trying to find its feet uh, every few decades when a new generational shift is taking place. Uh, so Disney, between its sports to entertainment, uh, so ESPN, of course, is a part of Disney's why I'm talking about sports uh, to entertainment. It, it started off, of course, with the Mickey and the cohort characters is where it defined itself as kids and family entertainment. And that's where the, uh, you know, uh, uh, divergence also into fun parks, uh, uh, children theme parks. Uh, and then uh, it started offering so much more wider content. Uh, and then right now it seems to be kind of you know trying to find a sweet spot to completely focus on and not be one uh, thing for everyone out there is how Disney seems to be evolving. But uh, one of the key things uh, taking it up from your question is their targeting of kids is such an amazing space to be in because uh, who you're talking to right now uh, as a generation today uh, who are influencers, so to speak, uh, of media and entertainment content or direct consumers themselves, shape up to be your future consumers. So if you're talking to 4 to 14-year-olds right now, the evolution is something that you have a clear line of vision on. So when they're 15 to 21, there is content that you can produce. When they're 21 to 35, in that age bracket, there is content that you can produce. So you're catching them young, like so many marketers talk about. And then you can create uh mega entertainment network is what i think disney's been able to do really really well thank you so much sir i think uh the session was really enriching
and uh, we were also able to answer all the questions and thank you everyone for attending the session i hope everyone has filled the feedback form and i hope that all of you have typed in your names correctly uh, you will receive the letter by next week as i mentioned earlier uh, a little bit about the next session the next session will be on unlocking the complicated yet exciting world of international studies taken by professor divya balan who is an assistant professor of international studies at flame university the world has become highly volatile and complex and our day to day lives are directly or indirectly affected by the war in ukraine suicide bombing in afghanistan election in the us population aging in japan oil depletion in bahrain and climate crisis in bangladesh how can we gain a better understanding of the world we live in can studying international affairs help us find solutions to the ever evolving global issues and make a difference in the world the session delves into these quintessential questions by discussing the truly interdisciplinary nature and scope of international studies discipline the unique and industry ready skill set it offers and the career opportunities in the public private non for profit sectors globally let's explore the complex yet exciting world of international studies please find the link to register in the chat box it was great having all of you here with us see you in the next session thank you so much Thank you so much everyone. Thank you.